Um, thank you for being patient. We're waiting for um, Jack Herzog, who joined us um, just now. So I want to welcome everybody today to our panel about powering the creative economy to drive economic development. I want to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for giving us this opportunity to talk about the importance of creative and cultural industries in a diversified economy. As you know, I'm Meyaza bint Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani. I'm here today not only as a contributor to developing Qatar's cultural institutions, but someone dedicated to helping my country realize its ambitious National Vision 2030. We want to build it for, the, for our children and citizens at large. By 2030, Qatar will be a vibrant and prosperous country with a world-class infrastructure with ambitious urban and cultural development. And most crucially, with a sustainable economy that enables all of us to thrive, including those who are sometimes left behind, women, youth, and differently abled individuals. At the heart of this vision is the understanding that the future of Qatar depends on the knowledge, imagination, ingenuity, and well-being of our people. Local creatives, entrepreneurs are drawing on the strength of Qatari heritage and translating them into a sustainable future. In turn, these forms of creative engagement build an economic ecosystem for consumers, entrepreneurs, investors, gallery owners, cultural managers, critics, and curators. Not to mention the consumers who visit our cultural destinations and attend our events, exhibitions, and work of the public art. This ecosystem is known as a culture and creative industries, or CCIs, and these industries are key drivers of economic growth in Qatar. CCIs are one of the fastest growing sectors worldwide. Globally, they generate an annual revenue of 2.25 billion US dollars, and they provide over 30 million jobs. And they are predicted to make up some 10% of global GDP in the next decade. As the world emerges from the effects of the global pandemic, the sector's high value products and services have the power to support a new economic order, an order that is more environmentally friendly and based on intellectual property. Over the past 15 years, Qatar has made significant public investments in the infrastructure of vibrant cultural and creative networks. These include globally recognized museums, the preservation of more than 1,000 historic sites and programming that ranges from works of public art created by local and international artists to education programs in schools, exhibition, events, festivals, and show. As you know, the 2022 World Cup, the first ever to be held in the Arab world, placed Qatar in the global spotlight and presents the country with unparalleled opportunity to further establish its national brand. The event is unique, showcases for the country's social, economic, and environmental achievements, and an opportunity to spotlight its future. In showcasing Qatar's cultural creativity, we will foster new understanding of our brands, accelerate mutual understanding and cooperation to shape foreign perceptions, and strengthen external relations and trade partnerships. Today we will talk about how we can showcase our heritage and culture in all of its forms as we continue to build Qatar's national brand and expand our economy. From our rich history as a sporting culture that goes back hundreds of years to our contemporary translation of our heritage through art and design, we will discuss important examples of culture and creative institutions now in development that build economic ecosystems that include artisans, manufacturers, restaurant owners, travel industry workers, and consumers. I'm honored to introduce a panel of esteemed athletes, architects, designers, and business people. I want to begin on the right with Abdurrahman Aswedi, who is the acting CEO of Qatar Development Bank, a key partner to our programs, as well as the chairman of the board of directors of Elan. <laughs> it's in English, so I like, wasn't sure what it says and the chairman of Qatar Business Incubation Center and the Center for Entrepreneurship and Career Development. Uh, next to Abdurrahman is Najla Zain, a designer of public seating commission for the new flag plaza, her most ambitious work to date from Lebanon. Her work has been exhibited at numerous public institutions, most recently at the Dallas Museum of Art Exhibition, Women and Design, and have been acquired by museums such as the Victoria and Albert in London, and the Dallas Museum of Art in their permanent collections. We have um, two Pritzker Prize winning architects in our presence who are building our future projects. 
Jack Herzog, co-founder of Herzog de Meron, is known for large-scale projects that include Tate Modern, the Beijing National Stadium, and the Dominus um, uh, Winery in Napa Valley. Jack is the architect of our new Lucille Museum, intended to display the most ambitious collection of Orientalist art, as well as other collections within the Qatar National Museum, and to explore the cross-influences of Western, Middle Eastern, and Eastern cultures. Alejandro Aravena, founder of Elemental, is best known for designing the Innovation Center at the Catholic University of Chile, the Vitra Children's Workshop in Switzerland, the Inter-American Development Bank headquarters in Argentina, and many projects of social housing in Chile. Alejandro is the lead architect of our new uh, project called the Art Mill, the conversion of the flower mills which will showcase the most expensive new collection of contemporary art in the world and also house a creative village. Also are joining our panel today is someone I do not need to introduce, but David Beckham, thank you for joining us. Not only is he a world football legend, but a great contributor and supporter to the creative economy. Since his retirement from the game in 2013, he has established his own business and brands and enjoys a significant social media following of over 150 million people. He is a committed philanthropist, and in addition to his 20-year role as a global goodwill ambassador, he established the Seven Fund for UNICEF, which focuses on women and girls' health, education, and justice. So let me begin with a question for each panelist, and then hopefully there'll be time for a conversation with a Q&A. David, welcome. I heard you had a sneak preview of the R321 Sports and Olympic Museum. Can you please talk about the impact of sports on national identity and how it helped you develop your own ventures thereafter? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very privileged and honored to be sat alongside so many amazing guests and to be invited by yourself. It, uh, it means a lot and obviously to be at the Doha Forum. Um, I think it's very exciting and a huge honor for me to be here and to, uh, to learn and to see the changes that can be made by some of the biggest leaders and the most important people um, globally. So thank you for at least having me here. Um, I've obviously, I went to the museum yesterday and I, I, I thought, what am I going to see? What is it going to be like? What is the experience going to be like for myself and also the children that I was there with yesterday? And I was blown away because I think that everything that you have done, His Highness has done, um, is all about the future of your country and the vision that you have that inspires so many people and inspires the next generation. And I think that's the power of the game. You know, I can speak from my experience of being in the football world, the soccer world. Um, it's all about legacy for me. It's all about inspiring the next generation of footballers, boys, girls, whatever culture they're from. And I think, you know, when we talk about you know, um, big competitions, when we talk about experiences, when we talk about the things that you are creating and things you are doing for your, for, not just for your country, but, you know, for the, the people in your country and globally, you know, you're going to have the eyes of a global audience on Qatar in six months' time. And that is, A, a huge responsibility, but it's also a huge moment to change so many things. I've seen how the global game, the biggest game uh, in the world, changes people's lives, and this is a real opportunity. So in answer to your question, the museum yesterday was an incredible experience, but the game has given me so much in my career. You know, I've been able to travel around the world, be part of different cultures, meet different people, and seen how the game really unites people, and I think that is the biggest part of you know, what, I've, what I have done professionally for the last 22 years, it unites people like no other game does. Um, and that has been an incredible experience for me throughout my career and my life. Uh, David, you're very invested in Miami, and I find that there's a lot of similarities between what Doha has done in Miami in terms of investing in hospitality, tourism, culture, education. Do you want to share with us why Miami or anything about your venture there? Um, well, the funny part about, you know, us talking about this is so many people have turned around to me and said, why Miami? 
And for me personally, I had the opportunity to go into business uh, after my career. And I started to plan that throughout my career, actually. You know, I had a, a lot of good people around me from family to friends that have been around me for a long time. So obviously when I went to America for the first time to start playing and to uh, begin my career again in America, I had the opportunity to obviously purchase a franchise. Um, and people turned around to me and said, okay, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? And I think Miami was really um, exciting on many different levels. You know, I think the fact that Miami is constantly changing, um, like Qatar, like Doha, you know, I've been coming here since 2008. I think the first time uh, I came here with AC Milan um, and I came as a footballer, but I could see the change. Someone turned around to me yesterday and said, how much has it changed over the years? And I said, actually, I was here a couple of months ago and it's changed since then. So it's constantly evolving, constantly changing, but it's all strategic. It's all done in the right manner. It's all done in the right way. It's not just, you know, we have a World Cup in six months, so we want to change, you know, the, the country. We want to improve. These, these, this vision has been happening for a long time, as you, as you well know, from, you know, from His Highness to members of the family, are constantly looking at new ways to improve the culture, to improve and learn from different from different learnings from different uh, cultures and industries. And I think that that is what really excited me about Miami. Miami is constantly changing, different businesses coming in from different parts of the world. You know, I've seen so much change happen. You know, even things that I love, which I know that you love, you know, the art world, the art culture. I love architecture. I love, you know, different things that actually people probably wouldn't expect me to love and wouldn't expect me to know too much about. but those things actually really matter to me. I really love those things. Um, so, you know, being in Miami is something that I have loved, but I have learned so much from. And the same here, you know, I've learned so much from being here, from learning the culture, to learning, you know, it made me, um, when, you, when you mentioned about, you know, um, the, the rich sporting history of this country, and someone said to me yesterday, you know, what do you say to people that don't think that there is a rich sporting history? I said, well, you know, do the knowledge. You know, look at the history and the culture of Qatar. Look how far it goes back. Look at the visionary um, leaders that are trying to change things and improve things. Um, it's incredible. Yeah, I remember the first time I met you was at the Qatar Tennis Open. And I think they're celebrating 25 years. So... Um, you're, you're very right in saying the vision goes a long way. And, um, you know, you have 150 million followers. That makes you the most powerful person in this room. Um, and you mentioned uh, quite interestingly that you started to plan your business career, even as an athlete, even as a player, with the support of friends. And I was very surprised when you told me you loved art and you collected art because sometimes you don't associate world athletes or superstars with art collecting. But I've also recently learned that a lot of the athletes that graduated from Aspire Academy, a venture of His Highness Sheikh Jassim, which a lot of the you know, gold medalists in the Olympics and the teams from the national uh, football team graduated from there, also interested in art. We'll see that at the opening of our sports museum. So I want to ask you, as I'm sure a lot of people are tuning in um, on social media, what drives you and how do you decide on what to do next as advice to future, you know, current athletes who are thinking about their future? Um, what drives me? Um, I think what drives me and what inspires me are my children, in all honesty. You know, my children are everything to me and Victoria. Um, but when we talk about, obviously, the social media following that I do have, I think what comes with having a social media following of that, scale I think is responsibility and I think you realize that when you have children I think when you have children and they're all on social media apart from my little girl who's only 11 so she's not on it for a few years yet um, it, there's a there's a real responsibility that comes with that and I think that obviously the opportunity that I have um, you know with having that following is is huge you know it's it's about making a difference for me 
Um, obviously on the business side, um, it's been very important in my business um, to grow it to a scale that, that it's got to. Um, but I think it's constantly evolving. It has to constantly evolve. Um, but I think that, you know, with, with a social media following like that, the difference that I have tried to make, yes, it's big in, in my business. Yes, I try to use it for the, for the right channels. Yes, I try to educate my children on it because over the last couple of years, you know, being at home, being obviously in this pandemic that we've had, I've realized how much time I spent on social media, online, and I'm trying to protect my children. I'm trying to protect, protect children globally as a goodwill ambassador for UNICEF um, and, and try to educate, educate people and children on that. But also, like we've, we're saying on the business side, you know, it's, it's, it's enabled me to go into different areas. It's enabled me to grow the business in a way that I probably never expected it to. Um, you know, it's, it's about surrounding myself with the right people. It's about having the right people around me that I trust and that have been with me for a long, long time and I'm lucky to have that. But, um, you know, on the, on the business side, you know, I've been able to start a, uh, a content studio, a studio which I'm very excited about. You know, obviously I've gone in recently to the metaverse and, and uh, obviously the NFT space and, and things like that. But those, those are the things in the business that are really exciting. But my main focus with having a social media following of that size is to al always um, put it to good use. And I think that we did that pretty recently with everything that uh, is obviously going on in, in Ukraine. You know, I, I was able to hand my, um, my social media over to this amazing doctor called Arena. And, uh, and she was uh, delivering babies that are premature in unbelievable circumstances. And no one was seeing this. No one was able to actually see this kind of thing happening. So I was able to hand it over and we were able to make people aware that then they could go on and they could help in a way that they never would have been able to. So that's what I try to do with my social media. That's incredible. And uh, content creation is some of the uh, things that the metaverse and NFTs for the creative economy that we're trying to support uh, regional artists here. And I, I've been watching your son, Brooklyn, uh, uh, blossom as a culinary chef, and I hope he'll come here one day with you and show us his talent. I'm going to move on to Alejandro. Um, who is, as I said, converting our flour mill that was built in 1982 that sits at the entrance of the new cruise terminal between the Museum of Islamic Art and the National Museum. Um, and he won a competition of over 460 people or architects. And I'm proud to say he never built a museum, so this will be the first. But um, Alejandro, can you describe to us how the design of the art mill complex will help generate opportunities for artisans in Qatar and for the creative industries in general? Well, uh, as you said, I may be the best example of a creative economy outcome. I mean, it requires bold bets. We have never done a museum, and this requires trust from your side. Uh, I guess it's a, the, the different nature of making safe bets in other economies. Uh, and one of the opportunities I see is that you can bet on people that are not the usual suspects. And I would like to tell you two short stories about this. The museum we're doing is at the entrance of the port that previously was uh, not open to the public. It will become open, it will expand Doha towards the ocean, and it will be the third uh, element of this compound of the Museum of Islamic Art by Yoming Pei the National Museum by Jean Nouvel, and then this new uh, museum to create the new cultural triangle or dress district. In trying to find the way to how to communicate, we have been, the, all the times we've been coming, we end up in the souk. And one time walking around, and we always had a hard time to find the same place again, there was this small shop of an artisan building miniatures of buildings in Doha, different buildings. And we were always dreaming, wouldn't it be great, the biggest compliment to a design 
that it can become a souvenir, that at some point it can become part of the popular culture. So we, before coming here, we went again, tried to find the shop. Uh, we did after a while. Uh, unfortunately, the gentleman didn't speak English. We don't speak Arabic. But somehow we managed to communicate that what if for the launching of the, of the uh, project in October, before the World Cup, we could commission him a miniature of the building so that it becomes a souvenir. We didn't manage to communicate that, that well today. But we will come back tomorrow. Uh, and I guess that immediately one effect that artisans, local craft, he has a, a, a sign there, had made by Doha uh, crafts. It, it's fantastic what he does, really great. So we hope that even before the building starts, we will already try to engage and trigger some positive consequences for uh, the local industry. Second story. The day before yesterday, we had a presentation of the latest version of the design. And we made some changes lately to think of the design of this building, not just an object that will be perfectly finished, but as an opportunity to make other crafts, other uh, hands, other producers to become part of the design. So it's not the building just for the people, but with the people. In order to domesticate this very tough and challenging environment, there's a huge knowledge in the Arab world to how to deal and create freshness. Some of the Musharabiyas may be used in the building, but would it, instead of doing it, all of them ourselves, we open a public call for different young designers, uh, local architects, uh, young producers, and crafts, uh, craftsmen, to come together to deliver what they've been accumulating as knowledge and become part of the building. So just with these two very concrete operations, we may be taking the opportunity of this building, hosting one of the most incredible collections in the world of art, to in addition become and expand towards its more uh, popular and, uh, and broaden audiences that this uh, building deserves. I think this building uh, is like parallel to what we did at the fire station of converting it into an artist in residence. I'm not sure how many people has, uh, have visited the flour mill as it's not a totally public uh, building. So I know you use the silos of the flour mills as the main element of design in considering your architectural uh, you know, competition. And it was a very tough competition. I mean, Jack Herzog was one of your competitors but we eliminated him, no, no. Yeah, I elim eliminated you because you have this amazing project that you'll talk to everyone about shortly. But, um, you know, and it went from 460 plus to then 12 to then two. And we knew as a jury, we were taking a risk, trusting someone who's never built a museum. But what was most fascinating for us is the use of the silos. So I know you have no visuals here. It would be great if you can project that to the audience here. And as David said, we are opening the silos and the flower mills during the World Cup. Actually, we're opening in October to allow people to already experience the building. So, Alejandro? So, I, I don't think it's a problem that we don't have a way to project. And, and, uh, actually, it's a good way to test whether you have a point or not in design. If you're able to com communicate just with words, your, your design. If you are unable, you may not have a point. Uh, so. And, and by the way, I'm so happy uh, Jacques was disqualified before, otherwise we would have never won. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And <coughs> so he was eliminated before. Yeah. Um, but again, when you're, you're given an opportunity, you don't let it go. You take it with, with your nails and teeth. And I think that's what we're doing. Um, but coming back to the silos. When we, even the brochure of the competition, had the plan, the footprint of the silos, and if you look at that plan, it looks as a geometric, abstract, uh, beautiful pattern. So we thought, what if we transform this industrial infrastructure as the basis of the design of the future, and we take the silos that actually are columns. Architecture in this region started by creating and domesticating the environment 
by creating shade without the roof. Hypostyle holes, which is a collection of, of many columns that are placed together as in palms in an oasis, uh, you're able to create a nice place to be in the public without necessarily having to create the building on the roof. So can we go backwards in time to this very basic operation and colonize the whole site, big site, maybe four times the Tate, and it's not just the building, but the city around, with these columns that then will become the main feature, the main element. But not just for the sake of doing that, but we thought it was a nice way to create, on the one hand, a landmark, and not to fall short, it's a very prominent location, but at the same time, the space in between, the void in between. The architecture is very much about what you don't build. And the space in between the, col the columns was definitely the place where we expect the public to gather, the public to kneel, and then we're feel welcome. I remember failing in the competition. <clears throat> At some point, we thought we had lost the competition. Uh, and to our surprise, and, and I really mean it, the competition was supposed to end when you had eight finalists. And then you added another phase, and we made it to two. When we were eight, we thought, that's it. Because of the way we read the body language, that that's nothing. And to our surprise, we went to the next one. But I remember saying that our design wanted, at least as an aspiration, to be seen as something that could have been built a thousand years before now, but also that it will be able to last for the next thousand years. We won't, I mean, I think this is Linda Evangelista that said that doesn't go out uh, for less than $10,000 out of the bed. Yeah. We don't go out out of the bed for less than 1,000 years. Let's try to achieve for that time scale. We wanted to achieve certain, certain timelessness with the building. So when you look at it, it could be one of those moments in history of architecture that you feel as if they have been there forever. They create a shared collective social agreement that this belongs to the place. And at the same time that they will be physically valid, there's the pure structure, that's the beauty of an industrial facility, but also culturally valid for the next thousand years. So yes, that's one of the aims that we are trying to put into uh, the core of the design. Thank you, and uh, I want to move on to Abdul Rahman, whose uh, whose work he's doing with the Qatar Development Bank is also a lifetime of investment into the economy. You are a strategic partner with M7 and supporting creatives, but also you have established several other incubations. What do you think is important for creatives and entrepreneurs to consider in order for them to be successful in your incubation journey? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, thank you, Your Excellency, and distinguished panelists with us today. Uh, first of all, we'd like to speak about the CCI since you have shed the light on it. I mean, I, I found it a bit difficult even for myself, first of all, to define a border for the CCI. It's a bit wide uh, spectrum and domain, I would say. Uh, so the only thing that we do have to standardize about the definition is basically the UNESCO. So the definition is basically, which includes the, the cultural and creative, natural heritage, uh, art, museum, and so on and so forth. As you, uh, your excellency mentioned, and I would like to reiterate basically about the importance of the CCI and the economic development. So basically we do have a, a contribution to the GDP by 6% to the global GDP. We do have a revenue on an annual basis of 2.2 trillion uh, dollar, also a job of 30 million job worldwide. So this is basically demonstrate easily the importance of the CCI and we as a country how we should support in terms of economic development. As Qatar Development Bank, as Your Excellency mentioned, we do uh, play a vital role basically in expediting and being a catalyst to the entrepreneurs and SMEs within the creative economy. By collaboration with M7, we have created basically the Scale 7, the first fashion and design technology hub in the country and in the region. The, the most successful factor basically for SMEs once they get into an incubation, it's not about how fancy the facility is. is. It's all about basically the focus and the core of the capability development program that you offered 
So basically the coaching, the mentoring, and, and uh, the training courses, the workshops, and basically certain specialized and technical expertise that you should provide within this facility. Also this complemented by the funding. So basically the direct funding, indirect funding, and most importantly, the investment aspect of the pre-seed and, and seed funding on a convertible notes aspect. As lastly, the complementation should be also not only from providing access to information and funding, it's also about exploration of the markets. And this is exactly what we are doing in collaboration with a lot of stakeholders within the country, is basically how we can get the MVPs or basically the ready-made product within uh, localizing it within the country and basically how we can access uh, international markets with it as well. Well, you're doing a great job. Uh, we've really benefited at M7. I can see your team is here in the audience, so well done. Um, one thing we find uh, as you know, a projection for the next 10 years for us is how we could further link industry to these creative economies uh, for major capital projects from hospitality, restaurants, housing, etc. Is there anything uh, you want to shed light on on this topic of how developers in Qatar or in the region can really support the growth of our creative uh, creatives? Sure. Well, uh, whenever we do any practice of localization and identification of business opportunities within any sector, basically we do a mapping of certain sector. The CCI, as I explained earlier, it's a bit wide. So basically we need to identify basically what are the sector that we should leverage and what, what sort of endowment that we should have. I think we do have certain sectors that they can play as an economic diversification pillar, where the other sectors are not neglectable, of course. However, they are considered as a power, powerful and strong uh, enabler sector. The, the practice is basically identification of business opportunities within those sectors, such as you mentioned, Your Excellency, the media, hospitality, tourism, and so on and so forth, and basically try to match make the existing or basically the emerging business opportunities basically with the buyers and how we can backward integrate it with the development of any mega project and capital project in the country. Thank you. We're working uh, with a few hotels here, integrating artists into their projects. But also, Alejandro, I think you'd benefit from knowing about how we can support them in our cultural village uh, as part of the museum. I'm going to move to Najla Zain, a Lebanese artist who's uh, been commissioned to do a wonderful public commission for our flag plaza which we will launch in the fall of this year. Um, Najla, would you uh, like to explain the process of your work and the size of the commission? Yes, hello. Uh, thanks for having me here. It's really, uh, really nice to finally come to Doha um, and, uh, and, be, and meet you, uh, Your Excellency, and everybody here at the panel. Um, so, uh, I've been commissioned uh, by uh, Qatar Museums uh, almost three years ago um, to create a um, public installation uh, that will be installed at the Flag Plaza. Uh, so, for me as an artist, um, it was uh, very new to me to think, um, to create pieces for the, for the public space. In a way, it was, uh, it was a, I had a sense of responsibility, not in a good or in a bad way. It was just uh, different. And I had, uh, this led me to many questions um, as an artist of what it means to create works uh, in the public space and what kind of impact and what kind of meaning this would bring to a public space. Given the size of the commission, uh, which is really massive, uh, I needed to be very careful in terms of um, in terms of how to go and navigate through this design process. Um, so it's a series of benches. We have about to give you the dimensions. We have about 300 meters of uh, of, of benches that have been sculpted in stone. Uh, this has happened in Lebanon, uh, so I'm very proud of that, uh, being Lebanese, um, and uh, with incredible craftsmen. And, uh, and what was really important for me uh, is that these pieces um, are used and are functional, so people, they bring people together, 
They're meant to be uh, seated on, uh, lied on, read on, eaten on. Uh, children need to play around them. Um, so that was uh, that was a very uh, important um, um, concept in the work and in the way of designing these works. Um, and in terms of process, the production was very challenging because uh, because uh, sculpting 300 meters. I mean, it's you know, it's uh, like uh, it's a it's a big project, especially doing it in Lebanon. Uh, this we need a kind of structure to be able to do such a project, which is unique, which didn't exist before. Uh, I chose to do it in Lebanon because, because uh, of my experience that I had with this factory, but because of the flexibility that I also have in, in working there, in the sense where I enjoy, as an artist, to be very close to my pieces. I'm, I'm part of the process. I'm part of every single decision that we need to make. And this is really a partnership uh, and a real journey um, with these craftsmen uh, to have created these pieces. Um, so I think you had a baby in between, didn't you? I had a baby in between, <laughs> yes, as well. Um, so aside from motherhood, uh, what did, how do you see that, you know, what, how does such a project become significant, not just to you as an artist or Lebanese artist, but Lebanon uh, beyond the art, given the economic, and socioeconomic conditions the country had to go through over the last few years. Yes, so this, the project started before the financial crisis in Lebanon and uh, before the explosion and uh, the downfall of the country. Um, so we had to move, uh, uh, you know, the moon uh, to make this project happen and to continue to make it happen. Uh, just to give you a few details, we didn't have electricity, we didn't have fuel, uh, there was a massive explosion. Uh, uh, people have lost most of their money, there's no more healthcare, I mean, uh, you know, you name it. So um, this project has given the scale of it, uh, you know, it's been two years we're working on it, two years every single day, uh, six days a week, uh, nine hours a day to 12 hours a day, every single day for two years, and it's still ongoing. So you can imagine what it does and what it brings to a factory that was not catered to create such pieces. Um, and, uh, and also to give you a bit of context, Lebanon is all, have always been known uh, for its very high skilled craftsmen. But uh, they were always um, um, involved in the traditional uh, sense of craft and the more classical uh, uh, approach to craft. Uh, this was a big shift uh, for all of these people to move from traditional craft and classical craft into something completely conceptual. Um, so in terms of conversations that we had, uh, understanding, you know, uh, how to sculpt the pieces, what are the movements that are expected, and we're all in it. Um, and given the situation in Lebanon, this project was a shed of hope for all of the people involved. It supported as well their families, but really it's not much about the finances that it brought to these people. Um, it's it's, it was really, you know, it's, it's a shift for them. And, and it uh, brought them to a different level today. And these people are catered, this factory is catered uh, to, to offer services to other people like me. And, uh, and I think that's very special. I think it's special to have been able to create something already new for the public uh, as an artist. I mean, this is a, a dream project but also to have created and put together a team that's really meaningful and uh, yeah. Thank you, Najla. We can't wait for it to finally be. <laughs> we can't wait for it to finally be installed um, and launched.
launch the flags with our community in preparation for the World Cup uh, come September. Now I go to Jack Herzog. Um, I think from the panelists, I've known you the longest, having worked with you for 15 years um, on this collection and project, moving it from one location to another, downsizing it to fit our, you know, the concept. Uh, but from the very beginning, uh, you had a very clear vision about the bus, the building. And clearly this is not your first museum. And although we change location, we change side, you never change design. So could you tell us how this, how did you inform your decision? <clears throat> Thank you, Sheikha, <clears throat> for inviting me. Hello, everybody. Um, um, actually, this architectural part is the least interesting maybe in this context. <clears throat> I very much like what you said, Naila, um, because this allows to speak a little bit about art and what art can mean for society. Um, and then Orientalism, which is, let's say, the kind of name of the kind of art collection that will go in our building. In itself, art is amazing for all of us and um, in the Western world very much replaces kind of the function of prayer rooms or religious functions. So the, the being with art and being exposed to exp a perception of art and involving you as a human in that perception process, this energy flow and this kind of sharing that is such an amazing function that I think to base economy but also city making, country making on art in a wider sense is super smart and important. And when, <clears throat> like in your case, Naila, um, the whole process that you describe, that it's not just that you buy a piece, you like drop art, you buy a famous uh, Jeff Koons, which you also do, which I also think is great, but besides that kind of more traditional form, to create in situ art, which then has such a powerful economic, social, political impact on a neighboring country in the Muslim world, I think this is in itself an amazing story, which I think could be the beginning of more of that kind of engagement, like uh, involving Afghanistan in, you know, concrete projects. And I think this leads to how the project has changed over time, that it has become more political, it has become more what Doha, Qatar, tries to be, which is a platform of exchange and debate and culture. I like the, personally, I like the, the notion of debate, of really also fighting, I mean, putting things on the table more than being peacefully and smoothly arranged together and not saying anything, but just polit polite things. So this debate aspect, you know, and to do a building, which in the case um, of our Orient formerly uh, named Orientalist Museum, to become such a place where the collection, Orientalist uh, was its name, is about how the East and the West have been in permanent ex exchange, not only uh, since um, um, 600 after Christ, but long before East and West have been exchanging um, political, social, cultural issues. And to make this, let's say, the main topic and function now in the 21st century, that's the main shift the project has been taken. From that point of view, of course, the building has been moved from one side to another, and the building is basically a kind of a vessel uh, that uh, ha inside has a very complex topography uh, of totally unlikely combination of a prayer room and an auditorium and a library and a anchor gallery, fragments of architectures from uh, Andalusia, from Egypt, from uh, Istanbul, in that we clash inside the building. So this whole architectural, let's say intellectual side has not changed, but how it was arranged and how the building increasingly made space for that debate aspect and for that dialogue aspect is what we personally have learned during that process and which I think will make that project um, really important, hopefully for Qatar, but certainly for our own experience. Um, 
Well, I remember one of the constant conversations you had with me is your inspiration about mosques and how that inspired a lot of your architectural practice. And this museum sits in Lucille on an island as part of a larger entertainment uh, project. You've incorporated that very strategically within the building. Can you, I mean, because of the location, because of Qatar being a Muslim country, could you speak more about that? Well, um, the truth is that I visited um, many countries, um, you know, from Andalusia in the West till India, you know, and I visited uh, namely, uh, of course, um, palaces, palace architecture, but especially mosques. And I think the Mesquita in Cordoba is perhaps one of the greatest buildings in the world and is one of, of the ones that touched me most, even if I'm not Muslim. It has uh, something that you don't need to uh, explain. You know, you don't need to be even a believer in that it touches you and it inspires you. And I think that's ultimately the role of architecture, whether hopefully it lasts for t a thousand years or whether, who knows, I mean, if we continue to act like this, maybe it's over much sooner, you know. But, but we have to do everything that what we do inspires us immediately, like architecture can do this through its physical presence or artworks can do this. Um, and um, yes, we give special attention to the little mosque that is in, inserted in the building. But somehow you could also see that the whole building is a mosque in that kind of looking at it. It has this powerful um, radiation. Um, you know, I don't want to go into details, it, um, but uh, what one thing, one aspect I think was very important, um, which I explained several times, I'm from Switzerland. This is, let's say, the most different possible country to Qatar, geologically spoken. Miami is much closer. Miami is where we also did a few buildings. Miami is also jeopardize, is t constantly threatened by the proximity to the water, one of the main problems we have in this world. And Qatar, what I fascinated me so much as being different from Switzerland, is the, the, you know, the boundary between land and water is not given forever. It's constantly changing, you know, up and down. And many, uh, what we consider to be land in Switzerland is granite, is you know, you, you, I, I always thought it's, it's forever. It was always like this, it will always be like this. The mountains, the ground is rock solid, like the mentality of the people. And, and here, that, that flux, that, that boundary is so fascinating, especially also on that island. Maha Island is an artificial island, so the island is also a piece of architecture and the building in itself, which has a, a kind of a planet-like shape or a fragment of a planet, is actually the land. So that notion, I never had that in a project in Switzerland. You know, in Switzerland you had the impression that you built something on something which is anyway much more important. Whereas here, the building had to be that land somehow. Thank you, Jack. You brought up many interesting points. Uh, we'd definitely be using all the artisans from uh, Qatar and the region in uh, doing the work inside the building, from restaurants to merchandise to interiors. I'm told we have two more minutes, and I'm happy that all the panel spoke at length, but I'll open it for two questions. Uh, first come, first sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much to, to all the panelists. Now, when you talk about the creative economy and, and economic development in particular, I think it's very difficult to ignore the role of young people as part of the conversation. And I, 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 I myself work in kind of youth and global governance, for instance, and center. Um, so aside from, you know, quite literally having a child in the middle of the process, congratulations. Um, how does, how, I'm kind of curious to know how the panelists may be involved if not already, plan to involve young people in the work that they do, keeping in mind that sustainable economic development is, is synonymous with intergenerational economic development. Thank you so much. Does anybody want to take that? Yes, uh, 
So basically, I think this question is set within the core of Qatar Development Bank. So especially with the creative economy, uh, basically we see that this particular industry is employed the, the it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a youth uh, focused sector, basically. I mean, if you see that employment is more than the other sector, the aging is from 15 to 29. So we as, we, we as QDB, basically, it's not about us launching certain incubation and accelerator only basically for, for enterprises or for companies, but also we start one step earlier, which is basically certain uh, youth centers, such as Bidaya Center, that we do have a collaboration with Salatik that basically focuses on youth, building, nurturing the seeds of innovation and creation within those youth. And basically post to graduation or even prior to graduation from universities, they can basically enrolled in a certain incubation and accelerator. And we do have many of them. We do have sport technology, we do have fashion and design, we do have digital and beyond and so on and so forth. I would like to add that we're launching a teenage council uh, as part of our creative or cultural um, initiative and we're launching it as also a legacy for the world cup because in order to volunteer at the world cup you have to be 18 and above so we are targeting 13 to 18 to work with us in our culture institutions so if anybody's living here and their teenager has not yet applied please encourage them because we it will be really an interesting dynamic group of of teenagers, not only will they participate as volunteers, but we will involve them in decision making and exhibition design and topic uh, selection for future projects. So we have one more question for one more person in the back. Uh, thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm a university professor in the United States, and certainly COVID did not help trying to convince students of the benefits of a physical engagement with culture and arts, everything moving virtually. I mean, David, I have uh, friends who have kids who'd rather kick a soccer ball on Oculus than actually a physical ball. Um, uh, Jacques, you mentioned uh, the Mesquita. Nothing beats going to the Mesquita and uh, experiencing it yourself as opposed to the virtual. I'm wondering what kinds of recommendations you have or how you would be able to shift the culture that seems to be moving virtual to still have, especially the youth, appreciate a physical experience. Thank you. Are you directing this question to anyone or? Um, anyone who would like to answer it. Anybody would like to answer this uh, question? Okay, David Alejandro. David, go ahead and then Alejandro. It's a good question because, you know, I talk about it all the time. Like you've just said, you have friends that, uh, you know, the kids would rather do and be kicking a football virtually rather than uh, actually being in a field um, kicking a football around. And obviously we have gone through, you know, uh, a difficult time and a difficult period in the last two and a half years. And obviously having a business as well, you know, there's nothing better than having your um, your friends, your family, your people that you work with sat in front of you working and working things out. And I think that's an important part of, you know, what we do and the creative side. You know, I've seen how the creatives have, be, have been um, affected, you know, especially creative arts in, in, in the UK have been affected uh, quite strongly uh, and quite badly. And this is where the future comes from, you know, and this is where creatives come from, and I think it's a big part of that. So, um, I will, uh, I will be personally working very hard to try and make a difference and try and make a, a difference in my industry. You know, obviously on the on the sports side. You know, going back to to your question, you know, I think that it's a it's a it's a huge part of you know what we try to do. You know, academy systems is something that you know, we really push for and helping youngsters and youngsters realize uh, their full potential and it's a big part of our, our side of things. But I think, you know, the creative arts have been really affected um, in the UK especially. I was once approached by a gentleman in, after a lecture in India and he said, it, the conversation was pretty much about this technology, virtual uh, and, and physical, and he said that we may be using 21st century technology, but the hardware with which we are using that technology is prehistoric. Our bodies 
haven't changed. If you look, go up in a Roman stair, our toes are pretty much the same. The comfortable and uncomfortable stair, it's pretty much constant and universal. So I guess that the fact that over the internet, over media, you may share information, what doesn't go through is communication. Out of the 11 senses over the internet, you may capture two, visual and, and, and listening, all the others go missing. And in order to jump into the void, which is by nature what the creative art means, you need more information. You'll be sharing with others. It's a collective act. That's why actually we're meeting here to move this project for the next step with all the creative team that came together. So I guess that the physical presence will be more crucial the moment you jump into uncertainty. And guess that we're living in one of the most uncertain times ever. So communication more than information will be even more relevant from now on. Thank you, that was a very long two minutes, but thank you to the panelists for making time and uh, sharing your insights, and I thank the audience for attending. Thank you.